Okay, good afternoon and welcome to Suffrages on this Saturday of the second week of Easter. Thank you for being with me today. Um, the scriptures, scriptures we're using today, uh, our psalm is number 149. Uh, we're going to move into Exodus chapter 17, and we'll pick up where we left off in First Peter chapter 4. Now let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? O everlasting God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, grant us your grace that we may study the Holy Scriptures diligently and with our whole heart seek and find Christ therein and through him obtain everlasting life. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Let's pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay, I'm going to pause there with the liturgy and move to our psalm and our lessons. So, Psalm 149. Hallelujah. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise in the congregation of the faithful. Let Israel rejoice in his maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praise to him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people and adorns the poor with victory. Let the faithful rejoice in triumph. Let them be joyful on their beds. Let the praises of God be in their throat and a two-edged sword in their hand to wreak vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings in chains and their nobles with links of iron, to inflict on them the judgment decreed. This is glory for all his faithful people. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Lord, let Israel rejoice in you and acknowledge you as creator and redeemer. In your loving kindness, embrace us now, that we may proclaim the wonderful truths of salvation with your saints in glory, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Our first reading is from Exodus chapter 17. We'll read verse 1 through 16. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, 
and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the, the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. Whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But when Moses' hands grew weary, but Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book, and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord will have war with Amalek generation to generation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so yesterday we concluded the story of the manna. And, <clears throat> um, and so we have a, a passing of some period of time here. Um, and I don't know that it tells us how long that is. Um, we know that until they arrive in Canaan, um, the people still continued to receive manna from the Lord. So anyway, so now we have this, all the congregation of the people of Israel. So the whole nation, right? The whole nation moved out of the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord. Okay, so... God has commanded them to do this. He has He has told them to move on. Um, and to move to Rephidim, which we think probably is um, in southern Sinai. Okay, but in that area there was no water to drink. Um, there's also a note on verse eight. Yeah. So we think we know about where this was, but I'm not entirely sure because the names of the area, places in the area have changed. So, so once again, just like before, oh, we're not gonna. We don't have anything to drink. We don't have anything to eat. We're gonna die of starvation. We're gonna die of thirst. And they complain to Moses. He is the go-between between the people and God. Give us water to drink. This is. Why are you arguing with me? Why are you fighting with me? Why are you quarreling with me? Why are you testing the Lord? So even though God promised to sustain them, the people accused God here of abandoning them, right? Like, all right, he's given you meat, you know, quail in the evening and manna in the morning every day. And you think he's going to let you die of thirst, where's the faith right but the people thirsted for water and grumbled against moses why did you bring us about up out of egypt and now we're just going to die of thirst us our children our animals and moses just turned straight to god what am i going to do with these people they're ready they're almost ready to stone me okay so god gives him instructions pass on before the people okay so walk in front of them I think this is important, okay, um, that they see him do this. 
take with you some of the elders, the leaders of those tribes, right? These are the people of influence and power, okay? If if they tell the people of their tribe to do something, they the people will likely follow their lead. And he says, remember that staff? We're going to use that again. It's an instrument. Just like you did when you struck the Nile and turned it to blood. I'm going to have you stand on a rock. The rock at Horeb. Right? So the staff was a symbol of God's authority. Right? And, you know, if Moses had just pounded with his hand, the people may have thought, that it was Moses doing this because Moses has to use something that makes it clear that God is working through that something and using Moses as his spokesman. Okay. <clears throat> and then the God says, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock. Okay. This is a theophany. It's the fancy word. This is an appearance of God. Okay. Now, it's interesting that in Deuteronomy chapter 32, several verses identify God as the rock. Right? So God is using symbols here. Um, one of the church fathers says, for them, water flowed from the rock. For you, blood flowed from Christ. Water satisfied them for a time. The blood satiates you for eternity. You, after drinking, will be beyond the power of thirsting. That was in a shadow. This is in truth. There's a whole lot of quotes here. That was just kind of poetic. I like that one. Um, so... I think part of this, there's a lot of different ways we can look at this. Part of this was it gave them another miracle. You can't get water out of a rock. That just is not natural. Okay. So God is showing them, I'm going to give you what you want um, from the most unusual of sources. And here it is. Moses did it in the sight of those elders, and it, it happened as God said it would. And he called the place Massa and Meribah. Massa means testing. Meribah means quarreling. Because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord. Is the Lord among us or not? They thought God had abandoned them. Hmm. This is why God said, you will keep an omer of this manna and keep it with you always. To remind you of what I've done for you. Right? I saved you from Egypt. I gave you food every day for 40 years. Hmm. So that's the first part of the story. Now this reading moves into a different, um, there's a different lesson here. This is the, the, uh, the battle with Amalek. Okay. Amalek is um, one of the local groups that, were already dwelling in the land that the that the Israelites were moving into. He was being invaded, so he came to defend himself and his territory, the Amalekites, right? All right. So Moses tells Joshua, Joshua is going to be um, Moses' um, successor. That's the probably the best word. Um, Moses is too old at this point to fight. He is not a warrior. He's an old man. You pick our men to fight. I will watch with the staff of God in my hand. Right? This is somehow Moses is going to um, Moses is going to contribute to this effort in the best way he knows with prayer, with the staff of God. Yeah. Joshua did, and they fought. Moses, Aaron, and her, right, went up to the top of the hill. Now, um, let's 
this battle will only succeed if God wants it to, right? These people really, they're not established. Like they're, they're, they're nomadic. They move around. So they can't really imagine their weapons would have been very, very rudimentary at best. The Amalekites have lived there. They know the terrain better. They know the area. They would have had both tactical and strategic advantage in these battles. Now, as it, as, as it played out, whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered it, Amalek prevailed. All right. Moses held up his hands, spread out in prayer, appealing to God for help, right? As in the phrase, stretch out, whoops, stretch out your hand, right? Um, yeah. Now, what else do we know when hands are stretched out, right? As Christ's hands were stretched out. Similar phrasing, right? not coincidence so moses being an old man needed help couldn't do it on his own right so instead of standing there so they're going to help him they're going to help him to have as much endurance as possible so the first thing they're going to do is they're going to let him sit so they found a stone to serve as a chair he sat on it and then they held his hands up Aaron on one side, her on the other. Each one held up. That kept his hand steady until sundown. Right? And because of that lengthy being able to maintain that, Joshua was able to overwhelm Amalek and his people. They prevailed in battle. And what, is, what does God say? Write this down as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua. Right? Remember that this happened, that I helped you even prevail in battle. This could possibly be the book of the wars of the Lord, which is referred to in Numbers chapter 21. Moses witnessed to the knowledge and practice of record keeping and sacred history. Joshua may have acted as a scribe. These events anticipated Joshua's future leadership of Israel, as well as additional battles with Amalek. All right, so Moses built an altar there and called it, the Lord is my banner. Um, the Hebrew for banner is related to the word staff, which links the altar to the place where Moses prayed over the battle against Amalek. So even in the wording, it's linked. A hand upon the throne of the Lord, right? Another play on words in Hebrew. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So they have enemies and the Lord defends them when they rely on him. <laughs> okay, let's move on to 1 Peter. So we're in chapter 4. We're going to read verses 7 and 19. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happen to, happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those 
who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so we continued our discussion yesterday about suffering. Um, uh, Christ suffered, and even before that was suffering for the sake of righteousness, right? This has been the topic for a couple of days. So talked about that yesterday. Now, the end of all things is at hand. Peter and the apostles really believed that Christ's return would happen within their lifetimes, okay? Even though Jesus said, nobody knows, nobody knows, but they still believed it. They were trying to be prepared for it. Christians even now live in expectation of the return of Christ, which could be at any time. Whether by his return or by our own death, we should always be prepared to meet him. How do we do that? Well, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Right? So he's he's wrapping up his last few opportunities here to, um, yeah, this is almost the end of the letter. Chapter five will be the the closing. But um, this is these are the this is how you need to conduct yourself. Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Um, We should avoid willfully committing sin. We should be in control of ourselves. Sin hinders prayer by turning our attention away from God and to ourselves. Right? Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. So this is notice how this is worded here, this tense. This is ongoing, not a one-time thing. Ongoing, continuous, and doing so earnestly because love covers a multitude of sins. In Christ, we love others and freely forgive them. Of itself, our love has no power to forgive, but Christ's love does. And we love because he first loved us. And his love covers all our sins. For us to love our neighbor shows that we are living in him. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Right? That means it's sincere neighborly love. As each has received a gift, which is the gospel and our salvation and God's grace and love and mercy, use it to serve one another. We take that gift, we receive it, we recognize it for what it is, and we that in turn helps us to love our neighbors, serve each other as good stewards of God's varied grace. The grace God gave to me is different from the, from the grace that God has give to, given to you because we each need his grace in different ways, in different measures, at different times. Whoever speaks, if you're going to speak, speak as somebody who speaks oracles of God. What does that mean? Um, just think of it as words of God. You're bringing God's word. Uplifting speech, which is governed by scripture. Right? When you speak, think of speaking for God, for Christ. If you are serving others, do it as you are serving by the strength that God gives you. So that whether whatever we're saying or whatever we're doing, it glorifies God through Christ. Why through Christ? Because it's Christ who enables us to do this. It's Christ who uh, washed away our sin and its effects and allows us to glorify God because glory and dominion belong to him forever back to suffering right don't be surprised if you suffer right don't be surprised at a fiery trial when it comes on you to test you like something strange like don't be it's he's saying it's going to happen we will encounter suffering in our lives because of this this fallen world great suffering afflicts some christians who may bear such crosses as God strengthens them through their affliction, right? Don't be surprised about it. But rejoice because insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, you are suffering alongside your Savior, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. 
you're, you'll be rewarded for enduring your suffering for his sake. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Right? Remember Jesus said, if the world hates you, remember it hated me first. Right? And if you endure that, you will be blessed. You're blessed just for being insulted for Christ's name because you're a Christian. You you bear his name by calling yourself a Christian. But none of you suffer as a murderer or thief or evildoer or meddler, right? These are sinful behaviors. Don't suffer for that. If if you're suffering, if you're punished for that, you you've earned it. Those things are not Christian. But if you suffer as a Christian, you are suffering for righteousness' sake. Don't be ashamed of it. Glorify God in your name, in his name. Sorry. Glorify God in his name because you are suffering for righteousness' sake. It is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Wow, what a statement, right? Some will see the effects of their own sin. God allows us to face such consequences that we might repent. But... What will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God, those who do not believe or refuse to believe without faith in Christ? There's no hope. When the gospel is preached, God begins to punish sin in order that he may kill and also make alive. If the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Right? This is Proverbs 11. Therefore, all right, because of all this, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. If God is testing you, recognize that God is doing something good in it. And trust God that he will reveal that to you and be faithful through it. That is how we endure. All right, let's close it there. Complete our liturgy. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but remember that we are ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now the Lord bless you, defend you from all evil, and bring you to everlasting life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that concludes our suffrages for this Saturday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me. Thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Um, so, um, Easter worship tomorrow. Uh, all Sundays in Easter, we will have Holy Communion celebrating everything that Jesus' death and resurrection accomplished for us by partaking of his body and blood. I hope you can join us for that. So. Um, again, I appreciate you being here. I wish you a blessed rest of your Saturday and of your weekend. And until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.